We are excited about Monday night. Uh, we get to come together and study the Word of God again at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We thank you, and we count it an honor that you would set aside the time to walk through the Word of God, walk through the life of Christ with us. Um, if you have any questions, feedback, or any prayer requests, we'd love to be able to connect our faith with yours according to the Word of God. You can connect with us at www.espressofaith, that's E-S-P-R-E-S-S-O-F-A-I-T-H um, at gmail.com. We are also on YouTube. We have our own YouTube channel, Espresso Faith. And so if you subscribe to us, you're able to be alerted when any of the studies are uploaded, and you can kind of go back through Matthew and any of our old um, messages and just kind of go line upon line. Again, if you have any questions, uh, we would love to be able to bring those questions to the study and tackle it. Um, I also wanted to kind of alert everyone that uh, when we complete Matthew, we're actually going to be um, breaking for the summer, but we're still going to have um, the word, of our studies going forth every Monday evening. It will be some of our past tracks that had generated a lot of questions, a lot of feedback, um, and I know that it will be a blessing to you And um, before we go into the next gospel going into the fall. So we open up with prayer, and if Regina's on the line, we're going to get started. All right, let's do this. <clears throat> Father God, we just come to you right now in the name of Jesus. Thank you so much, Lord God, for this opportunity to delve into your word once again. We thank you, Lord God, for the opportunity to just be alive and to be in health, Father God. We thank you, Father God, that no matter what our uh, situation and circumstances may be, they may not be perfect, they may not be ideal, but Lord God, you are alive and you are living on the inside of us. You are rejuvenating us. You are quickening us on a daily basis, giving us what we need to make it through the day. Father God, we thank you that we're not just survivors, but we thank you that you said you renew our strength like the eagle. And so, Father God, we thank you today that we will be strengthened with might in our inner man as we delve into your word. Thank you that you said your word is alive, it's quick, it's powerful. We, we thank you that because of that, Lord God, it is energizing us. It is quickening our bodies, even right now, Lord God, as we pray. We know that it's evening time, and we know that we've had long days. But, Father God, we just thank you that we're energized, we're rejuvenated, we're excited, Father God, to um, dig into your word. We're excited to learn more about you. We're excited to grow, Father God. We just pray, um, Holy Spirit, that you will quicken us today, that, you'll, that the word will unfold and that there will be revelation, knowledge, and understanding, that there will be light that will enter us and that we'll be able to see on a deeper level, Father God. We thank you that questions that we've had, Lord God, will be answered. Lord God, you know our intimate thoughts. You know the things that we think about. You know our needs, Father God. We just pray that as we dig into your word and as we share, Father God, we thank you that you will answer those questions, that you will bring revelation. Lord God, the things that we've been praying about, Father God, that um, it will be clear, Father God, that we will have our um, a spiritual uh, awakening, a spiritual aha moment, not, not Oprah's aha moment, but Lord God, a real aha moment in the word where uh, questions that we had and things we didn't understand are now suddenly clear. Father God, we just pray that um, for those who are listening live and those who will be listening by replay, we pray for a blessing over them, Father God. We just pray that you would send laborers across their path, Father, to minister to them. We pray, Lord God, that those that minister to those who are not quite uh, who be saved yet, and for those of us who are saved, Father God, we just pray for boldness, Lord God, that we will be examples on our jobs, examples in our schools, in our workplace, in our communities, Father God, that we will be an example and light of, and demonstrate the light of you, Father God, so that people will be drawn into the kingdom. Father God, now we just pray that as we uh, dig into your word, Lord God, that it will continue to unfold, that we will be blessed as a result, Father God, that our uh, direction will be clear that our purposes will be revealed, Father God, that the things that we, we will begin to see ourselves reflected in the Word, Father. Father God, let's pray for all of the moderators that are on this call, Lord God. Bless each and every one of them. We pray for the individual families and their situations, Father God. Uh, we just keep, Father God, that you, you are everything that we need. 
you are all in all. There is nothing that, uh, Lord God, that we can't do. We thank you, Father God, that all things are possible to, to them that believe. We thank you, Father God, that as we place our affairs and our cares in your hand, that, we, that they're taken care of. We don't need to worry. We don't need to fret. But, Father God, we thank you that when we place things in your hands, that they're taken care of. We thank you that you're in charge of all of our affairs. We, we let go, Father God. We're not trying to um, complete things in our own efforts. Uh, we know that our resources are limited. But, Father God, you have an unlimited resource. You are an unlimited resource. And, Father God, we thank you that where our own ability ends, Father God, you, your resources and your continues on, and there is no end to it. So, Father God, we just thank you today for all that you will do, for everything that you've already done. We give you praise and honor for the word that's going forth. Father God, we just we thank you, and let, let's just do this. We give you praise and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 That's all right, please. Hallelujah. We left off in Matthew 26. We didn't get very far now that I'm looking at it. Um, but we talked about, we left off talking about the woman anointing Jesus' feet, and then we talked about betrayal. Um, so anybody got anything that jumped out? Say that again. Anybody have what? Does anyone have anything that jumps out that they study that they want to talk about immediately? You all finished that discussion about uh, was it in the was it twenty fifth chapter? I know what you're about to say. You about to talk no, no, about no, no, that 20, woman? No, that was in the twenty sixth chapter about the alabaster body. We all we all we all comfortable with that now? I'm I'm still I still haven't done my due diligence with trying to figure out who that lady was. I'm gonna just be honest. I'm going to have it. I don't. Oh, I don't have it. it. I know Sherry this sent me a really Bible. good link. This is a Bible study. Go ahead and go over it. This is a Bible study. We can. All right. Dad, I know you and I talked, and we linked this back to the other Gospels. Um, I guess we'll just start with that. Well, Sherry, why don't for anyone who's just now listening, kind of fresh with us tonight, explain, kind of go back and give a little history. Yes, yeah, so last Monday we, we we were dealing with Chapter 26 and we're going over um, discussing the woman who anointed Jesus' feet um, with the oil from the alabaster box. And we talked about verses 6 through, I believe, 8 to 10, somewhere in there. And we discussed what an offering, what an honor it was for her to do this we also discussed how um, certain folks and some certain disciples were indignant about her being wasteful of this expensive oil, um, but Jesus recognizing the honor that she was doing and that the preparation she was making for his body for death. Now, the discussion kind of started to triangulate a little bit for, um, around who is this woman who is anointing his feet. Um, there was a perspective that this is the same lady from Luke 7, I believe it was mentioned. And then yes. there was discussion that this is Mary, Lazarus's sister, the same Mary with Martha, Martha, um, when she was, Martha was busy about things and Mary was sitting at her feet. So does that catch everyone up? Yes. Yeah. All right. Um, so Dan and I had a little bit of a discussion and we kind of looked back at the other gospels to, uh, tie in to understand better who she is. And so I'm going to start with, we already know the scripture in Mark, it's Mark 6 through 13. It talks about, meanwhile, Jesus was in Bethany at the home of Simon, a man who had previously had leprosy. While he was eating, a woman came in with a beautiful alabaster jar of expensive perfume and poured it over his head. The disciples were indignant when they saw this. What a waste, they said. I'm going to stop there. So let's talk about just where they're at. They're in Bethany. And when you look at the scriptures that talk about where Lazarus is at, Lazarus is in Bethany. And let's jump to Mark 14, 3. And actually, I'll just read Mark 14, 3. Mm, 
Okay. Very long chapter here as well. Okay, so Mark fourteen three. Talks about it says again it discusses the woman anointing anoints Jesus with perfume. Meanwhile, Jesus was in Bethany at the home of Simon, a man who had previously had leprosy. While he was eating, a woman came in with a beautiful alabaster jar. I'm sorry, I'm reading from New Living Translation. Um, perfume made with essence of nard. She broke open the jar and poured the perfume over his head. Um Continues down to verse four. Some of some of those at the table were indignant. Um, they talked about the waste again, um, and then Jesus had to deal with them about criticizing and um, you'll always have the poor. Now, what's interesting about this, and then there's another account in John as well, John twelve um, one through eleven. Um, but what's interesting about this is um, the reason why this is. First, let's talk about where they're at. They're in Bethany. And Matthew, Mark, and John all talk about the place of Bethany, which is where Lazarus was at in Bethany. Um, Simon, the home of Simon, a man who had previously had leprosy. Um, I think the discussion last time talked about the fact that Simon was a Pharisee. Is that what you said, Siobhan? Yep, I'm still with you, Sherry. Okay. So one point to note is that Pharisees couldn't have leprosy. They had these, this thing about being clean. You know, they had this whole get up about you got to be of a certain cleanliness and a certain manner and a certain order. And so leper, lepers couldn't be Pharisees. So that's one part. The second part is the account in Luke, I believe it's Luke 7, doesn't talk about Bethany at all. Whereas Matthew, Mark, and John's accounts all talk about Bethany, the location. And then if you read back a little bit, I think it's John's account. Dad, help me out. Is it John's account that talks about Yeah, John 12. John 12. John's account goes straight from talking about Lazarus. Lazarus being risen from the dead. Yep, he talks about Lazarus being risen from the dead and goes right into this account. And Lazarus is sat down with him at the table. Yep. And so there's the correlation to how we get to this is Mary Lazarus' sister. And, and it's also have, Mary and it's also Mary and Martha that's being discussed relative to Lazarus and Lazarus sitting at the table with this particular um ointment being being um being poured on Jesus. And yep. whereas the other woman in that mark is considered as a woman of the city. Right. And so I'll read John's account, John 12, six days before the Passover celebration began. And again, he's prepping for the Passover in Matthew 26. As you go down to verse 17, he's prepping for the Passover. Six days before the Passover celebration began, Jesus arrived in Bethany, the home of Lazarus, the man he had raised from the dead. A dinner was prepared in Jesus' honor. Martha served and Lazarus was among those who ate with him. Then Mary took a 12-ounce jar of expensive perfume made from essence of nard, and she anointed Jesus' feet with it, wiping his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the, uh, was filled with the, what was it? Oh. With the great experience. Yeah, with the aroma. Um, and then, again, Judas, Judas Iscariot, the disciple who would soon betray him, said the perfume was worth a year's wages. It should have been sold and the money given to the poor. And we know the rest. So, there is John. John fills in the holes that Matthew and Mark don't give us. Does that make sense, folks? Does that kind of use the Bible to use the I would say so. Bible? Otherwise, you get the commonality of Bethany being discussed in Matthew and also in John, and you have um, <laughs> you have the commonality of you know the event, the event whether Jesus was was poured on Jesus, and then you have um, yeah. And then in the other one, you know, the woman is described as woman of the woman of the city, and um, like Sherry said on occasion, Simon is a common name, but I don't believe Bethany is mentioned at all in the um, in the Mark account. No, it's not in the Luke account. Luke seven. 
I'm sorry. Yeah, Luke. It's not mentioned, and then again, the point that Pharisees could, they were not supposed to have leprosy. Right. All right. Any questions, comments? Claire, does it clarify? I'm done with it. I'm done with it. I'm I'm done with it, Sherry. My my issue is I actually need to do my due diligence and study where I had a discrepancy with in the Luke um, seven account or not Luke seven, but in the Luke account. I just feel, seven. yeah. And and the honest truth is that you know Jesus attracted many different women wanted to serve him. This particular woman was. Um, uh, special because of her assignment in preparation. Like we kind of drew that out last week. She was she was utilized and it didn't matter like what her past was. That's why I believe she was someone who had a sordid past. That's where I was kind of getting it from. I didn't think it was it was Mary at all. Um, so I need to still do my due diligence. I apologize. I'll have to bring that back with me next week and maybe maybe just peel out like five minutes. And it may, I may find that my study is in complete agreement with yours, but he, like this woman was so critical in preparing him for what was to come and encouraging and ministering to him. So, I mean, I'm not in disagreement. I just need to do my own personal study, though. You know, the other thing about it is that Simon, the Simon mentioned in Luke 7, he's busy talking about Jesus. I don't know who might have been women on him. This woman that sees him. So if he, it was a, if he had a leper, um, leprosy problem, you know, most people that's in sin or, or being, you know, or being isolated or ostracized themselves, they usually don't talk about some other, some other persons. You know, he talked about this woman like she, she shouldn't be around here, you know, you know, messing with him. And if he had a problem... Simon, Simon the Pharisee, uh, in Luke seven. You know, I, I put it this way again. You know, people with problems do throw things like they throw rocks, but they got they live in glass houses, but they throw rocks at other people's houses. But you know, again, I, I think uh, I think I think what Sherry said earlier, Simon was a common name. <clears throat> and I see these two women as two different women, and in my caption of my Bible, not that not that that means the 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 absolute end, but it says. Jesus forgives a sinful woman. What he did was forgive her of her sin for what she did. She realized who he was. She was honoring him. She gave him the ointment. She unloaded the alabaster box on him, and, uh, and he forgave her her sin. Mm-hmm. And I, I'd like to also point something out. There's distinct differences in the Luke 7, 36 to roughly 40. There's, the comments are completely different from the Matthew, Mark, and John, and even the account in Luke 10 about Mary and Martha. That's in Luke 10, okay. 30. The comments about this woman in Luke 7 from the disciples are completely different than how they treat the, the, the woman in Matthew, Mark, and John, and even in the Luke 10, 38. They, okay, it could, be, it could be different women. That's okay. Then too, you know, I the other thing about it. They're making comments about the woman directly in Luke seven thirty six versus Matthew, Mark, John account of the woman. They only make comments about the wastefulness of the oil. Okay. The other one is focusing on, you know, this sinful woman, how dare she come up on you? You need to be more careful about who you got. You know, the comments are different. Well, uh, too, I don't think he even made a comment concerning the woman, the sinful woman, the woman of the city. Concerning his burial, as I'm looking at it, he doesn't. Oh, he, he just didn't. gets into talking he about her. Never talked about the burial. He just commented that, that about her. She's forgiven okay. her sin, and she loves hard. She loving on me like she loving on me because I'm forgiving her much. People who forget forgiven much, you know, they love and, and they appreciate being forgiven much. People who think, ah, I'm pretty good anyway. I'm good enough. Yeah. You know. you, Dad, are you referencing the woman in Matthew 26? No, no the woman Luke in the, in the Okay, Luke 7. Okay. 7.36 so through 43. Okay. Okay. All right. Go. All right. Okay. So we'll let you take your time and study it out, but we wanted to present as, as the correlate across the Gospels, the difference is um, the Gospels discuss Martha Mary Lazarus and and in all of them, they discuss it, but 
Matthew, Mark, and John discuss this specific instance um, being around Bethany, being in Lazarus' home, and, uh, you know, triangulating that back to try to determine who, who this woman was versus another woman who came and also anointed Jesus as well. All right, let's move forward then. Uh, we got through Judas and betrayal, so let's go from there. Who else has something that's burning on their spirit? So go ahead and touch them. I don't, I don't know if you guys have anything, but I thought it was really interesting, and we may have brought this out even last time, but I just kind of highlighted it again where Judas went to the chief priest, and he, you know, he goes, what are you willing to give me if I hand Jesus over to you? Again, talking about that, that betrayal, his availability to come in agreement with the enemy. And I just was looking at just the relevancy of today, what happens when we come in covenant and we say we come in agreement to be used by the devil, you know? And I just look at how, and it says in verse 16, and from that moment Judas began looking for an opportune, an opportune time to betray Jesus. We also know that the chief priest, just looking at the, the pyramid or the hierarchy structure, first the, the, the chief priest, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, they all conspired together how they could get in. You can even go back to when the devil was dealing with Jesus in the wilderness when he first started his earthly ministry, like launched, um, began launching his earthly ministry, the devil went away after he tempted him, and the Lord kept saying, it is written, it is written. It said that he went away to return at a more opportune time. Again, the chief priest, he found a group of people he could work through, and they, they began to conspire. What, what is a good time for us to get them, arrest them? We don't want to do it at a time where it can cause a riot during Passover. They're, they're, they're laying in wait to look where they could get an end. And here they found Judas. Judas was available. Judas, we don't know how long it had been brewing this betrayal in his heart against Jesus. And here he was available to turn on him. That's a good question. Why, like, when and why? Why would Judas even want to betray Jesus? Like, that's, that's the question. Why would he want to do that? Because he didn't have that same revelation that Peter had. So if Jesus had said, who do men say that I am to Judas, Judas would not have been able to answer the question uh, affirmatively that he was the Christ. He was just a good person and, and obviously some a, 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 an opportunity. He saw Jesus as an opportunity to make some money. You know, he was his, his mind was clearly on money because he was there as a treasure and he was already stealing. So, you know, when the word talks about the, the life, the lust of other things, you know, enter in and choke the word and prevent you from being able to see who Christ really is because you focus in on what you can get from him or get for yourself. And so that was his focus. So when it came to, oh, what's another opportunity for me to get money? Hey, I'll give up Jesus. I can really make it rich that way. So, you know, it's the same thing now with people who are out in the world or, or people who have gifts. God has blessed people with, you know, singing talents and, and all these different talents and, you know, they feel like, oh, I can't use it for, for um, Jesus or for the, for Christ because I'm not going to make that much money. But if I go out and use it in the world, oh, there's a lot of money to be gained. And you talk about, you look at people like, and not to name names, but I mean, look at Katy Perry. She came out of a Christian home. She wanted to be the next Crystal Lewis or whatever the lady name was, that um, Amy Grant, you know, mm-hmm. and yet you went to that to admitting that you sold your soul to the devil so that you could be popular. I mean, these are, people make a decision. It's about what's important to you. And if you don't have a true relationship and a true revelation of who God is, you will have a price. You'll find yep. yourself selling out for what for whatever you view as valuable. If anything you view as more valuable than God or any, because we talked about idols before, anything that you place before God is your idol. And, and for you, that might be more valuable, and that's your price. So the question is, what's your price? Yep. Wow. Wow. So that's good. Yeah, I thought about yeah, often to open that that's door. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Someone else was talking. No, I was just saying that's pretty heavy. The first words you said is mm-hmm. the difference in revelation. That's got to be it. Yeah. That's how I'm saying. Yeah, and, and it is because it is got to be it there, and, and Regina, because if, if you look at, again, looking at some of the other gospels, they, you know, the other disciples may have not taken it to an extreme of betrayal because 
it's apparent that Judas had a grievous heart, very apparent. A greedy, he was just flat out greedy. He was money hungry. He wanted status, money, position. And he thought, you know, I believe that the thought, based upon Mark 10, 35, 37, I believe they thought that it was going to be this, you know, when you get, a, like, I think it says something about when you sit on your throne, you sit in places of honor, you know, who's going to be on your right, who's going to be on your left. They were looking for status. They were looking for, you know, positions in Jesus' new government. Um, and, you know, he's looking, Judas is looking at this situation. And I think the oil, pouring of the oil was like the straw that broke the camel's back. You know, <laughs> he, you know, you know what I'm saying? He was losing his mind. <laughs> yeah, when, when Jesus saw, you know, he praised Mary, he praised this woman for pouring out the perfume worth of a year's salary. He must have sat there and realized, okay, I'm not about to get it. No status, no physical or political status, no money, at least not physical. You know, this must be something else. And because he was so greedy, he had a greedy desire for money and status, you know, and he realized this is not going to happen following Jesus. I just, I'm going to get this this person up for, you know, in exchange for money and favor from some religious leaders. Now, let's bring this to another, another layer on this. Matthew is the only gospel that talks about the exact amount of money Judas accepted to betray Jesus, 30 silver coins. Do y'all know that that's the price of a slave? So it's talked about this in Exodus 21. I believe it's verse 31 or 32. But it talks about the price of a slave. And if Judas was even sitting there paying attention, you just made yourself a slave to the religious leaders, not an equal, not somebody that's favored, you know. It, it just amazes me how folks don't even realize you've given up once, you know, you've given up a good thing to do a dumb thing. Anybody got anything on that? You said the price of a slave, to buy a slave was 30 pieces of silver, is that what you said? 30 pieces of silver, 30 silver coins is the price of a slave. Exodus, I believe it's Exodus 21. Let me grab it. Huh. Isn't there a passage of Scripture, and I believe it's in these Gospels, where it said the devil entered into him? Yes, yes. I believe it where is, too. Where is that? Yeah. That's in these Gospels. It is. Um, to this. And what that tells me, or it just came to my mind. I haven't found it yet because I'm looking at 14, Mark. It has the same discussion of events occurring. Um, it's, in, it's in Luke's account there. Luke, Luke 22. Luke 22. Daddy, Luke 22, I think three. One, two, Luke or three, three. Yeah, that's it. And no, it doesn't, it doesn't say when it entered. Yeah. Well. But you know, and you knew the time. devil was looking for an end. Yeah, then entertained into Judas, surname is Scarlet, being Luke 12. Luke 12, he went his way in command with the chief priests and captains how he might betray him into them. Well, the thing that comes to my mind is just that. Well, sure, are you looking for Exodus? Go ahead. Um, yep, I got it. So go ahead. What comes to my mind is that we can't play with this stuff with our flesh, with, with our thought processes, with our thought life, you know. When the Bible tells us to think on certain kinds of things, what sort of things are this and that and this and lovely and a good report, you know, we have to guard our thought life, bring every thought into captivity. We can't play with our flesh. We can't change. Well, I'll try this one more time because, you know, you open the door and, you know, uh, and I, I can't really say, maybe I've experienced it in my lifetime on an occasion when I have been so caught up in doing something that was contrary to my best interest, that was certainly contrary to what I know was right, but... Since I wasn't under a religion, I took it as, well, that's for the religious folk because I ain't religious. And so I was doing this thing with this thing had me. And so, you know, Judas, who he was, practicing what he was practicing, having the point of view he, that he had, thinking the thoughts that he had about money and whatever else, you know, no doubt that was the door that was opened, you know, or, or that allowed the devil to enter in. And when the devil entered in, you can't stop it. It's like, it's like you're just going on down that mountain. You see you going, you see you falling, you didn't felt halfway or three-quarters of the way. But you can't stop. So, you know, it just comes to my mind 
We do need to guard our hearts, guard yes. our thinking and make decisions to back up off of certain things. And, I mean, and fight the fight in terms of your thinking processes. You know, don't just be, you know, caught up meditating on things that are contrary or things that, that you know, um, lend themselves to the works of the flesh because the devil get in, he'll make a catastrophe out of that, which is probably glorious. It's you know, like the, right? Like, what did you like, say, It's like being possessed. Yeah. Like you have yeah, no control. Being, I missed what you said. You said it's like being possessed? Yep, being possessed. I, I'm not even going to give people that much credit. I'm going to say they go on in partnerships. They ain't possessed that much. They write on, they, they in agreement. They walk in hand in hand with yeah. I, you know, I think, you know, I know Regina really, you know, hit it when she talked about him not uh, seeing and recognizing who Jesus was. But he was in agreement with the Pharisees, like, oh, okay, so you're not going to open your Romans and put us on top. You must not be who we're expecting. So it's nothing for me to betray you and take you out your position. You're not who you I can see thought that. we I can were. See that. I can see that. What? You're not what? who we what? thought you were. You're not who I thought you was. And so when people get disappointed, even when they're on your team and you're not who they thought you were, beware. When people get disappointed, they will try to betray you. Like his heart wasn't with Jesus, clearly, and he, he just, even with all the teaching that he was doing, you could teach till you got a bang popping out on your neck. If people don't want to believe, they want to harden their heart and have a different expectation, people make choices. Period. Yeah, but that was a choice think, that he made. I think a little bit, I, I agree that it's a choice, but I think there was a realization that, that I think with the, the alabaster box and everything that went on, I think he finally made the realization that, okay, on a real tip, this is not going to be a physical kingdom. This ain't even going to be a political thing. This got to be all spiritual, and that's not what I was looking for. I think the realization mm. was a realization that this is a spiritual kingdom, but I don't want no parts of that. I want money, fame, status. I want uh. well, I'm about that dollar. I believe that he had a realization of it with that porn of that perfume. I believe <laughs> so. He did have a revelation. Huh? <laughs> I think so. I, I just, I mean, it wasn't until that oil got poured out that, that he checked. You know, well, you know what, when he said, when that oil got poured out, in verse 11, he was, he, remember how, you know, they had become indignant and angry, and I think it was Darnisha that talked about it last week, like, they got indignant, like, do you know what that means? They were really infuriated about the, what they felt was a waste, and Jesus rebuked them and said, you will always have the poor, but I will, you will not always have me, and they still, I just feel like, even though he had he, and then he went on to let him know what she was doing was preparation for me, like in a good thing for me. And if she was ministering to me, there, like Judith and Wadilla with his response, he didn't care. <laughs> right. That was that he just he didn't care. Like right. That's why wow. I he had a realization of what was really going on. And it's like, it's almost like that person that you get a realization of the truth, but you're like, that's not what I wanted, though. <laughs> And then you just right. going on indignant, and you going on about doing to get what you want. Mm. Oh. It's sad. It's sad. That comment yeah, about like, thirty. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I mean, like you said, he was there for the wrong reasons in the first place. He was just waiting on his opportunity. He thought Jesus was going to make him great, give him popularity, and he was always there looking for what he could get out of it instead of trying to receive from what, what Jesus had to give to them. And, and yes. of course, Jesus. Um, you know, Jesus would have been, you know, upset when they got upset about the pouring out of the oil because it's kind of like, y'all miss, why y'all following me? Y'all following me because y'all believe I'm the Christ. So how how dare you get upset and not uh, appreciate what this woman is doing? Right. If if I'm Christ and I'm the one that God has sent, am I not worthy of this oil to be poured yes, on me? I was just thinking that. Was just thinking that. Yeah. You know, so it's just. I don't know, and like you said, I think Judas, like you said, Judas had a revelation that his revelation was that y'all all crazy, <laughs> you know, and it's like, okay, you all about the business, so. Kept you know, that, that means he never had the heart of Christ anyway. You know, you got to understand the character of God. He came to be to serve, not to be served. 
But for those who had an understanding of who he really was, then they knew they was to serve and honor him on a different level of respect, different level of, you know, who this person is. He's God for crying out loud. And you got the audacity. And you know what, Sherry? He never, you don't see in the Gospels where Judas acknowledged Jesus like that either. There were others who displayed loyalty. You know, you got Peter. No, I'm not going to deny you, Lord. And all these people cutting ears off, jumping in. They felt like they had Jesus' back. Or even in their words, like how much they loved him. But you never really heard Jesus, ref- not Jesus, Judas referencing, uh, reverencing him like that. You never heard him. Uh, I don't see it in the gospel where he called him master, teacher, Lord, nothing. He didn't. And he didn't. He never seen him. Called out. And you know, but, you know, the funny thing is, go ahead, I'm sorry. That was me. No, that I was going to say that Jesus, but... But yet Jesus did not turn him away from the beginning. Jesus allowed him to stay as one of the disciples. Mm -hmm. Why? Because the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. And Judas was probably more likely called to be a disciple, which is why Jesus allowed him to travel with them. But he just never got a revelation of of the calling that, that he had on the inside of him. And it's a lot of people that don't understand their purpose. And you think you're there and for some other reason, but it's like, no, this is what God has called you to do. And so Jesus allowed him to stay. Unfortunately, he just never, never caught on until it was too late. But, you know, but, he but wasn't you know, a I think there was a hope. I think there was a hope that he would choose. Like, you know, you know how you always say, God, no, I was going to do this anyway. People say that stupid comment. No, he is hoping that you make the right decision. Choose. He gave you <laughs> He don't want you to be a darn puppet. But to the same token, he's, he's, he's praying that you choose the right decision. Like, Make the right choice, Judas. Make the right choice. You just see all these. But you know what, Sherry? Just to that to that statement that you made, the Lord already knows what choice you're going to make, and it still didn't change the fact that He was going to work with you. He still was going to. He ended up using Judas to still bring the situation glory. You understand know what I mean? There's a lot of times like you were talking, like people want to blame God for things. Something the devil going to be the devil. He's going to do what he's going to do. But let, let but God gonna be God as well. It doesn't stop. The, it never stopped the plan of God. It never did. He used what was already growing in the hearts of men. He wanted the best for Judas, and he had choice. Period. Yep. He still loved him. He kissed him. Like don't just play a going to do what you gonna do. You know, right in the face of his enemy. Yep. And that's just no. No, it is good. No, um, <clears throat> this is something that, just as you all are speaking, Mark six fifty two comes to mind. And I heard a heard a pastor preach this, and what he preached. Well, let me see. I'm gonna read it. It's Mark six six fifty two. It says, and we talked about this before, but it it seems like it's right on time without with discussion. It says, what they can say. Now, this is this is Jesus. Let me see. Come walking on the water. And they got, and then you know they thought he was a ghost. And um, Mark doesn't say it, but some of the gospel says this is also the time when Peter got out of the boat and walked in water, and Jesus rescued him. And they got in the boat. Now here's Jesus. He tells them, "Don't be afraid." In the 50th verse, he says, "Be of good cheer. It is I. Be not afraid." It's like you walk on the water, of spirit. In the 52nd verse, he says this. It's, it says this. They considered not the miracle of the loaves, for their heart was hardened. And I know I'm not reading the whole context and the whole thing that happened, but the way this pastor presented that verse in particular, he said, when you don't give proper consideration and honor, when you don't recognize or realize who you got before you, who you walking with, who you have access to, it puts you in a position where your heart can be hardened. And if you get a hard heart, you know, I want to now say, you know, that's like a door being opened. You're, you're now available for something other than the truth. You're now available for something other than the honor you should have been given. And um, mm-hmm. it just makes me think, you know, for sure. You know, here's all the disciples. You know, rather than, it says they did not, I mean, it's kind of like a peculiar way of, of, you know, they're saying that, you know, the scriptures kind of says that, you know, here he is, and walked on water, and Peter would have been walked to him a little bit. He gets in a boat. And and then it describes them as having hard hearts. 
and it associates it with the fact that they did not consider the miracle of the loaves. And so, again, they didn't have a revelation of who they were dealing with. They didn't fully, properly consider Jesus. And so I, don't, I, I want to say the hard heart comes first, but maybe, maybe it doesn't. It's, it's in a, and, and this is how the preacher preached it. He preached it as when you don't give honor, it sets your heart along a certain course. And when your heart gets hardened, then you can't receive. You can't receive revelation. You can't receive them. And then I, I want to say that maybe that's what makes you available for the enemy to enter in. Mm, it does. Harden to God. But that's, that's mm-hmm. good. very good. In agreement. Yep. It, it, just yep. like when you're praying, you're coming in agreement with heaven. You're coming in agreement with God's word. When you are, you're, it's a prayer. It's, just, it's conversation with heaven, conversation with God. Same thing, when you're having a conversation with the devil and coming to the group with his mess, this is, you're available. This is, this is what manifests. I mean, it was just, it, it, when it says the devil comes to kill, steal, and destroy, we know Judas' d- demise, his final outcome was just pure death, period. And you and, know, um, I want to see it. I want and to the see devil it wrote him. Hmm? I want to say very specifically now, he had a hard heart toward the truth, toward revelation, Toward the things of God, and what else you got left? You available for the oh. devil to use you. Yep. Which yep. equates you back to a slave because it equates you right back to a slave because the Pharisees and them basically treated him like a slave. You a slave to the devil as well because you're allowing yourself to be used by the devil, available for what the devil got. And that's why they gave him 30 pieces because it just marks you as a slave. You're not free. Well, you know what? Sherry, that was excellent. Like it, it is, it, it is. Like that's that he was paid like a slave, straight up. There's a there there is a reward, but we know that I, was. I give y'all this. How I know that. Um, Exodus twenty one. I want to. Oh, give go it, ahead. So I, how I know that this thirty pieces. Um, Exodus twenty one talks about how you treat slaves, treating slave fair treatment of slaves, and I think it's verse yeah verse thirty two. It talks about if the action of Oxen gores a slave, either a male or a female, the animal's owner must pay the slave's owner 30 silver pieces. Uh. The slave ain't but worth 30 pieces. That's all you were, slave. So what, what is that, Exodus what? 2132. 2132. I want to go back to something that Stanley said about the... Um, Mark six fifty two through fifty nine, where he was saying they considered not the miracles of the loaves, uh, for their hearts were hardened. And just make a practical application here, um, you know, as the disciples did not acknowledge the previous miracles when they found themselves in a position of need, being in the boat and the um, storm coming, and not believing that God could deliver them. How often do we find ourselves in situations of need? not reflected, not rightly honoring what God has already done for us in the past, you know, the blessings that he has already done for us. And we find ourselves like, I don't know how I'm going to get through this situation. Lord, I really need you to do it. Lord, come through for me. And we like beg, and it's like, hold on. What has God done for you already in the past? Do you not still trust him? Has that power expired or run out, or is it no, no longer, you know, valid? Are we oh, not – like the disciples in a position of a hard heart where we have not acknowledged and given credit to what God has already done and, and counted him as faithful to do it even now in whatever the situation is. So anyway, when he yeah. said that, that just sort of stood out to me. I want to throw that out there for our listeners. No, that's good. Uh, that's good. For every, everybody, how about that? That's rehearsing yeah, past victories. He, he's that's still good. that same guy. Oh, girl. You know, I, w- I have something I wanted to pull out real fast before we close, Sherry. Um, that was good, Regina, though. Um, in Matthew 26, where Jesus, you know, we talked about the people amongst us. You know, the Lord already knew who would, um, you know, betray him. And, you know, you see them sitting down for uh, the, the Lord's Supper, that last supper, and it says, you know, as they were eating in verse 21, he goes, I assure you and most solemnly say to you that one of you will betray me. So he called it out on the carpet. And I love the boldness of Jesus. Like, yeah, 
Like, can you imagine eating bread, y'all breaking bread, everybody chilling, and then Jesus just break out and accuses one of them of betrayal? And they all said, surely not our Lord. So you already knew somebody was lying. And Jesus went on to say, he who has dipped his hand in the bowl with me as a pretense of friendship, the Amplified Version says, will betray me. And I thought it was really good, that word, as a pretense of friendship. When you say the word pretense, you, it means an attempt to make something that is not the case appear true, a false display of feelings, attitudes, intentions, a, the practice of inventing imaginary situations in play. And I thought it was really interesting, that word that was used in the Amplified, because you get people sitting around lying in your face, no, that wasn't me, I didn't say that. No, that wasn't me gossiping on you, falsely accusing you. I didn't do that, or I'm not trying to betray you. Not surely, not I. They were just sitting there lying. And, he, and they were pretending. And and you'll have that, you have to watch for that spirit on your team. And the Lord, when you're sensitive to the Lord, the Lord will show you people around you who are there to hinder, there to tear you down, to destroy you. They, they will. And it will come in the form of family. It will come in the form of people, you know, over your money or whatever it is, whether it's ministry, whatever it is that you're doing, the Lord he will show you, and Jesus knew who that person was, and he still lied boldly to his face. And so um, I just kind of wanted to put it out there that you, you, you definitely have to walk this walk circumspectly by the Spirit. There are people who the Lord will tell you, don't leave that person in, in position. Like you know what they're doing and what they're – I don't mean to sound like Godfather, but keep your enemies closer sometimes. You have to – I don't know. Like I just – I don't know what comments you guys have to make about Jesus' decision right there, but he called it out on the carpet, and that person still lied. It's true. You know, it's true. Well, that's an example for us. How do we treat people when we know that they don't mean us any well, but yet they smile in our face? How do we treat them? Mm-hmm. You know, it, he laid an example before us. You yeah. love them. So, yeah, you're right. Or in Jesus' case, he loved them to death. In Jesus' case. Yeah. <laughs> you know, when he didn't put them to death, their choices put no, them to death. No, he didn't put them to death. Your own choices will, will put you on, your own self in the grave, literally. Your own right. Choices. You know, I think it's interesting that, that Jesus said, I think it's Jesus' words. I know the scripture says it. It would be better for that man not to have been born. I mean, yes, that, 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 that kind of, that's what I'm trying to say. He, that, that was cold. That kind of bothers me a little bit. You know, it's like, it's like, uh, wow, you're the man that came to give his life for the sins of the world, for all mankind, for all sinners, for everybody, including Judas. And then you make this. But if you're not going to utilize your life to do oh, the oh, will oh, of God, oh. it's. Let hmm. Dad finish the vine. Let Dad finish the Okay. No, I am finished. I'm finished because I don't, I don't quite, I don't quite get that exactly. You know, like well, that's what role. I was saying, Sherry. My understanding of it is, if you're not going to utilize your life to be surrendered and used by the Lord, it really is waste a waste. It really is. That's, that's you're doing good. something dumb. That's, that's actually very good. In other words, like, yeah. I don't know whether you said it, Regina. God's going to get the best. He's going to accomplish his will, whether you go into the left with him or you go into the right. He will use yeah, yeah. Pharaoh's heart, Pharaoh's stubbornness or whatever. You know, I mean, it's, it's yeah. The, the curious question is, when he made that comment about better that you not have been born, that was in reference to knowing him, right, knowing the truth, right? That's a good question. I don't know what it's in reference to. I mean, I feel like, mm-hmm. like saying there's, there's no help for him. No. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. At the end of the day, you end up in hell. It probably is better if you had not been born. Right. Right. Still be wasting folks' time. Jesus saying, you know, in purgatory, <laughs> you're going to have another chance. Are we going to pray you? And when you die, there's going to be a bunch of us praying you too. No. It's like, hey, it would be better you not to have been born, born Jack. That's, yeah, it's deep. Because your right. consequence, your end, you know, the... What you gonna read is, you know, just there's just no hope for it. Whatever, whatever you about to experience. You know, so, I'm a poor, I guess we could say he went to hell. I guess we could say he went to hell for sure. I wonder could we say that? But he, oh, right, the Bible says also he couldn't find a way to repent. I think that's something we can find in there. 
he, he searched, but he couldn't find repentance. Or, or maybe, I think he's talking about Judas. Maybe he's talking about somebody. I mean, could be getting things mixed up, but you go to search for Look, repentance and you can't find it. You'd have done something so bad to imagine. you forgive yourself. Uh. Yeah, it's hard to imagine that he went to heaven if he said it's better that he hadn't been born because if he had gone through all that and even at the very end turned his life over to Christ, it would have been worth it because, you know, any time anybody makes it into heaven, that's something to celebrate about. So no matter if they just slipped in by the skin of their teeth, it's like, glory to God, they made it in. But if he says it's better that you had not been born, well, he wouldn't, I don't think, to me, that's it. You yeah, it. you didn't make well, it. I, I feel like he went to hell because he still, in his own selfish demises, killed himself. That's that whole, woe is me. You're still thinking about yourself, <laughs> you know, so yeah. you go off and kill yourself like a knucklehead. Otherwise, I can't live with myself anymore. Let me die. But you don't, but right. you don't know about, about, about when you open up your eyes after death. Yeah. Well, I know we done went over, um, and, Dad, I know you've got prayer. There was a prayer request about um, from Siobhan just praying that she has an excellent, peaceful week, productive week, this week. Um, does anyone else have any prayer requests? Does anyone else have any final comments before that praise? No, I've enjoyed the study. I enjoyed the discussion. It was very good. All right, Pete. Pop, take it over. All right. Father, we just thank you for the opportunity we've had to sharing your word. Every time we share your word, there's light. I appreciate the excellent spirit that we have, Father God, and it's perceivable that we are all here for one purpose, to identify this person of Christ, to understand more so, even more so, who he is, who we are in him, who he is in us. Scripture says that we in him and him in us, so we can ask him and he'll do it for us. It says that we're the branches and Jesus is the vine and the Father is the husband and whatever we ask the Father in his name, he'll do it. I mean, we got it going on. You said that uh, you pray for us, those who are given to you, uh, that we not be taken out of the world, but we be protected from uh, the evil that is in the world. Father, I'm just so uh, so excited about this. Uh, I appreciate the fact that even as we study the scriptures, um, I was studying today, um, in Second Peter, and they kept talking about knowledge, 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 knowledge. There is the call to this common, like, precious, mutual faith. It talks about it in Peter, and he said, but it comes through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. And then he talks about grace and peace are multiplied in us through the knowledge of God and Jesus the Lord. And then he says we have these exceeding great and precious promises that by these who are partakers of divine nature, having escaped corruption in the world, and he talks about through the knowledge of the glory of God. It takes a knowing you, Jesus. And we want to know you. It ain't about titles. It's not about somebody patting us on the back. It's not about the accolades of men. But it's about the confidence that we have from day to day, Father God, as we live our lives out and those who are on the phone listening, as we live our lives out, Lord Jesus, that we are becoming more confident and more rehearsed. And there is a knowing in our spirit concerning the things that you intend for us and the things that, um, well, things we don't have to be worried about. We don't have to be worried about, you know, the daily bread. You said, you said that you would supply all our needs according to your riches and glory of Christ Jesus. And so we have, these, we have these promises and we have this go-to and we have this centrality in you. And so, Father, as we continue to share on this phone, I know you said that a prepared heart will get a revelation. We don't want our hearts to be hardened. And so we are going to add to our faith, virtue, knowledge, patience, temperance, godliness, boldly, kindness, charity, these things being in us and about me that will not be barren nor as unfruitful, and the revelatory knowledge and the epignosis knowledge of who you are. We want to know you as a friend, as a person, as we know each other. You are the person of the word, Elohim God. You are the one who was and is and is and is to come. You are our everlasting to everlasting. You are our big brother. You are our Lord. You are the one and whom we begotten. We are all begotten unto God and by God's power in Christ. When he raised you from the dead, that's when we got raised as newness of life. That's when we got. That's when we were born again. We were born again in Christ under God. Scripture encourages us in the fullness of time you sent forth your Son that we might become adopted sons in Him. I'm satisfied with that. When we go to bed at night, and I think about the Scripture right now, it says we lay down in peace and sleep, but Thou makest us dwell in safety. We can have a nice, comfortable, common, complete 
restful sleep because you make us dwell in safety. All we need is in Christ. And it's not a religion we're trying to have. It's not something we're trying to insist upon other people, but it's a place of rest for ourselves. And it finds us able to show love to other people because we know it. It's not something we're mentally ascending to. It's not an argument we're trying to have with somebody. As we walk this walk, Father God, and you show yourself to us, we indeed are those examples of light to others. And so, Father, I thank you for the Bible discussion and for those who made themselves available in sharing your word. You've been in the midst of us. The Holy Spirit's been right here sharing. I pray for the one prayer request that's been asked. I pray specifically for Siobhan that she have a good day tomorrow. I guess she has some things that may be challenging and some challenges that may present themselves. The evil one is always present, always present. Evil always, when you go to do good, evil is always present, wants to do evil. And so we rebuke uh, the players. We rebuke those who've adopted roles, even as Judas adopted and opened his heart and had a, had a hardened heart that made him susceptible to the enemy's plots and ploys. Whoever volunteered and raised their hand for the role to act out the devil's plot and ploys against Sharon. Oh, I tell a scripture real quick. Smack him on the cheek. That's third Psalm. One, two, three. Third Psalm. Smack him on the cheek and break the teeth, Father, and let them know that it's you who's doing it. No, Father God, that they can't rise up against the children of the Most High God. And so, Father, I just thank you again, Lord Jesus, for this word that is quick and powerful, that's encouraging, and that it's able to go to Bermuda, it's able to go to Raleigh, it's able to go to the upper peninsula, it's able to go and suffice where it's needed, Lord Jesus. Even as we speak, it is the spirit word of God, and it's going to be effective, and it's going to make the difference in our lives as we share. You are mending and uh, knitting your body together. You've got us in specific places um, to operate, Lord Jesus, you've given us roles to play, and you're using us by your spirit as the spirit will. You're using us in the operations of the spirit, and it is exciting, Lord Jesus. You are giving us, Lord Jesus, wisdom as to how to utilize our time so that, you know, we're reminded as royalty that we work for God, and all of our other roles are supporting cast for the kingdom. We are, I heard one pastor say, we're undercover. We're undercover doctors and lawyers and, and retail persons and, and mathematicians and, and, and um, uh, people in business. We're undercover, but it's the kingdom of God we're perpetrating. It's the kingdom of God we're pressing forth and pressing into. And, Father, this is a wonderful, this is a wonderful centrality for life. And so I'm giving you praise. I'm giving you thanksgiving for it. And we bless you. We know you hear our prayers and your honor. We know we have the petition we desire of you. And we give you thanks by the blood of Jesus, and in Jesus' name, if you agree, you can just say amen. 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 Yeah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Think, amen. Hallelujah. I think we're off on Monday due to the holiday. So uh, enjoy yourselves. Have a good, safe holiday weekend. Hallelujah. And then I think we convene again the first Monday in June. First Monday in June. Okay. Peace to you all. Be blessed. Thank you. All right. Good night. Bye. Bye. Bye.